really, really clearly. Um, so here we go. Let's just start. Let's just get right into it. And thank you so much, uh, JD. You know that you and Demia mean the world to me, and and I could never say no to you guys for this invitation. And um, to the to the to the back scene that no one sees, the backstages. Uh, thank you uh, for for making this happen. You know, and I and I just want to say what JD did. It. We were here way on time okay like 10 minutes before the stream should have began and it's just been insane but the devil must be doing this for a reason which just means that we got to do our parts and do it even better than he can because he's already defeated so uh praise the lord for the internet at the end of the day <laughs> um, my sermon title today is entitled um on the run on the run and i'm coming from genesis chapter 32 and i'm gonna um read you verse 22 to 24 as a preamble to what we're going to talk about today. And so it says, during the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives and his two servant wives and his 11 sons and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. This left Jacob all alone in the camp and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. Uh, this, um, this, this, this evening, I wanna to speak to you on the sermon entitled, On the Run. Uh, let's just pray real quick. Father, we just ask that as we go into your word, that your spirit may be felt in this place, in our homes, or wherever we are watching this stream, and whenever we watch it, Father, but we know, God, that you have a word from us, and we will trust you to come through with that word even right now. Bless us and keep us, Father. In your name we do pray. Amen and amen. Running. Unlike uh, Pastor Lola Moore Johnston, who just completed her 21K half marathon and by the way, she deserves a huge congratulations. She doesn't know this yet, but she ran it not just for herself, but she also ran it for me. So go, Lola, go, go. I am not a runner unless there's a fire, in which case I am jumping on the nearest back of someone who is closest to me and will carry me out of the burning building. I kid, of course, but if you ever perchance see me run, you should probably run as well. Uh, running as a sport, it's just, it's not for me, but, but I know that people like to run. Some run to receive the medals and the accolades. Some run to lose weight. Some run to improve their health. Some run to connect with nature. Some run to just try something new. And oh, and, and, and there is one of HBO's newest releases, a show entitled Run. Ruby Richardson and Billy Johnson, one time college lovers, made a pact when they were 19 years old. And in, if one of them ever texted the word run to the other and the other texted the same back within 24 hours, they would drop everything, meet up in Grand Central Station in New York and take a train together across the country. Ah, uh, but they are no longer 19. Instead, when a 30-something-year-old Ruby sitting in the parking lot of a Ralph's supermarket gets a text message from Billy that says, run, she barely stops to think before she texts back and jets off to New York to meet Billy. The real twist of the series is that Ruby and Billy aren't really running off with each other. They're trying to run off with the 19-year-old versions of themselves to rediscover the tangential youth they never lived, at least not with one another. Instead, they are met by the adult quasi-strangers who are much more dented with age. But before you start to judge their crazy life choices, let's be real. The confinement of their lives to a moving Amtrak train may seem a bit 
too real with the confinement that most of us are experiencing in our lives. And no, I'm not talking about the physical confinement that you are currently experiencing. I'm talking about that mental confinement that just like Ruby and Billy's urge to uproot their lives is caused on a one worded ambiguous text. And though not the most thought through plan, that mental confinement will make you make some physical choices that would cause you to skip town and ride the rails, hoping that the light at the end of the tunnel is not an oncoming train. But HBO did not create the concept of running. Running is not the origin of the mental instability of the runner in this Genesis drama. No, the antecedent of his running was caused by something completely different. The book of Genesis, aside from telling us how Earth began to take shape from a shapeless, voided chunk of nothing and the development of our sinful nature, it introduces us to Abraham and his family. God had set out to give Abraham children like the grains of sand, says Genesis, and children he gave him. His direct descendant was Isaac. Isaac's sons were Esau and Jacob. And not to belabor you with the details of the familial isochronism or succession, nor the dysfunctional family dynamics, there is one particular sin that distinguishes this family from the rest. They have the generational curse that seems to follow them. That is, uh, they are, well, they're a family of liars, deceivers. Now, 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 don't be too hard on them. They get it from their mama and their dad. Thanks, Adam, or as Pastor Goodman called him last night, the unoriginal, the, the patient zero. It's very unfortunate, yet very true, that one of the biggest struggles in the human condition in our carnal state is the ability and the ease with which we lie. Ah, lying. Walter Scott said it best, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. And it's so easy to do, yet such a hard habit to break. Satan, the father of lies, first lied to the angels, making them demons. Lies to Eve and Adam and so on and so forth. And here we are today, a cluster of a bunch of liars. Abraham in Genesis uh, 12, verse 1, was told by God, however, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I, where you go, you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. And all peoples of earth will be blessed through you. But like a hypochondriac, Abraham creates a self-induced amnesia. In verse 11, he looks at a pending situation and controls it as he sees best. Verse 11 says, as he was approaching the border of Egypt, Egypt, Abram said to his wife, Sarai, look, you are a very beautiful woman. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Let's kill him. Then we can have her. So please tell them you are my sister. Then they will spare my life and treat me well because of their interest in you. And if, as if that wasn't enough. Genesis 20 says that Abraham then deceives Abimelech. Uh, I want you to go to Genesis chapter 20. It says Abraham moved south to the Negev and lived for a while between Kadesh and Shur, and then he moved on to Gerar. While living there as a foreigner, Abraham introduced his wife, Sarah, by saying, she is my sister. Note that his name went from Abram to Abraham, that her name went from Sarah E to Sarah. Ah, that's going to have significance later. Remember this name change. She is my sister, he says. So King Abimelech of Gerar sent for Sarah and had her brought into his palace 
And because the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, Genesis chapter 26 says, so Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And it says in verse one, a severe famine now struck the land as had happened before in Abraham's time. So Isaac moved to Gerar, where Abimelech, king of the Philistines lived. Verse seven, when the men who lived there asked Isaac about his wife, Rebecca, he said, she is my sister. Ah, he was afraid to say she is my wife, he thought. They will kill me to get to her because she is so beautiful. Verse 8 says, but sometime later, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out his window and saw Isaac caressing Rebekah. Immediately, Abimelech called for Isaac and exclaimed, she is obviously your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? Well, because of Bimelech, the way that generational curses befall, well, my daddy did it to you. My granddad probably did it too. And my great granddad, my great great granddad did it to God. And I just couldn't help myself. It's the way that I'm wired. I'm a victim too. I have the virus. The way that my DNA is set up. Feel free, uh, Facebookers, to insert your excuse here. So this desire to control everything generationally passed on empowers Jacob to pray over his situation with his brother Esau. God had already taken care of Jacob's issues with Laban, but now he was about to enc encounter his brother and Jacob is scared. So he prays. Genesis 32 chapter uh, verse nine says, then Jacob prayed, oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. Verse 10, I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but I will surely make you prosper and I will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. Jacob asks, intervening, asks for God's intervention. And yet, just like Abraham continues to follow his own agenda, we do the same thing. We work it out on our behalf because we are always in control. Hmm. We are always in control. And even while wrestling, Jacob felt like he was still in control. Huh. Watch this. Verse 24 says, so Jacob was left alone. And a man came and wrestled with him till daybreak. Don't miss this. It's in your season of detachment that God attaches himself to you. Oh, for all my sports fans out there, uh, uh, there is a difference between boxing and wrestling. As nouns go, the difference between them is that boxing is where two opponents punch each other with gloved fists. The object being to score more points by the end of the match or by knockout or technical knockout. Wrestling is the sport where two opponents attempt to subdue each other in barehanded grappling using techniques of leverage, holding, and pressure points. Their goal is not only to subdue, but to gain and maintain a superior position. In other words, wrestling is more intimate, more physical, requires more leverage and knowledge of the body, and in order to wrestle, proximity is always required. Ah, when the man saw, it says verse 25, that he would not win the match. He touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Before the transformation happens, everything must change. In a normal hip joint, the rounded top of the thigh bone, the femur, fits into a cup-shaped socket in the pelvis called the acetabulum. This type of joint is called a ball and socket joint. When the top of the femur moves out of its normal position in the socket, the hip is said to be dislocated, limiting a person's mobility. 
A hip can become dislocated during many kinds of accidents, including falls from high places and motorcycle or car accidents. Jacob's hip has gotten him into some trouble. Ah, ah, that hip, that hip. Jacob has been running with that hip his entire life. The first moments of his life, when he was about to come out of the womb, he probably, in my sanctified imagination, used that hip to thrust his entire right side of his body forward, to use that hip as a leverage, to grab hold of his brother Esau's heel, as if he were trying to pull Esau back into the womb, so so that Jacob would be the firstborn, as if to say, you will not tell me my place in this world. You will not decide what my birthright will be. You will not tell me how far I will go, how high I will reach, because I want you to know that I was right there with you, says Jacob to Esau, almost in a satirical way. And we know later on in life that, that that is the same hip he uses to scuttle over to the flock and bring his mother to choice young goats so that he she can prepare the deceitfully delicious food for his father to steal his brother's blessing. Ah, that hip, that hip was the same hip with which he ran away from home and went to serve his uncle Laban with. Ah, that hip was the same hip he used when he met his new wife, Leah. Yes, Leah, not the wife he wanted, but the wife that he got. And ah, you would think he would wait the seven more years to get Rachel, but no, he immediately puts that hip to work and he works for Rachel all the while using that hip to start the 12 tribes and the 13 children he would eventually have because let's not forget his daughter Dina. And when his hip gets his wife Leah pregnant and his wife Rachel becomes jealous, she gives him Billa, her maidservant, to have children with Le with, with him. And so Leah sees this and gives him her maidservant Zilpah to have children with as well. Ah, that hip of Jacob, because that's what Jacob knew, to depend on his hip, to depend on his talents, to depend on his skills, to depend on his strength. Ah, but God had to show up and touch Jacob right there on the hip, right where he had the problem, right where he thought he had all the solutions. And God had to show him that his place of perceived strength was actually where all of his weakness was coming from. Ah, because everything that Jacob did with that hip was unbecoming. Jacob depended way too much on his abilities. So by touching his hip, God said to Jacob, you are not in control. You will not tell me what to do. You are not stronger than me. You cannot defeat me because I am. And so God touches Jacob in the place of his strength to create a permanent weakness. Hear me today. You may be looking at your life and asking God, God, why are you allowing this to happen? Why is my marriage falling apart? Why are my children so disrespectful? Why is my boss so illogical, unintelligible, and contradictory? God, why is it that I cannot seem to succeed or get ahead in life? God, why does everything happen to me? But I'm here to tell you today that you are not allowing God to change you. You're wanting instead to wrestle with him to get your way. You are not allowing him to show you that you have not been depending on him, but instead you've been depending on yourself. Jacob depended on himself. So when God touches him right in the source of his perceived strength, Jacob falls apart. Ah, but God gave him, hear me now, a blessing. Verse 26 says, then the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. When you feel that you are in control of your situation, you're actually out of control. Notice that the boldness of your request is proportional to your need and despair, but you want God to bless you as you are instead of how you should be. He says, bless me. Verse 27, the man asked, 
What is your name? Jacob, he answered. What is your name? What a weird question. I was perplexed by this question. Did God not know who he's been wrestling with this whole time? No, 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 Michelle. What the Lord was asking him is who are you? Who have you been? Jacob means seizing the heel. He took hold of something in order to control it. My name, Jacob says, means to follow, to be behind, but also to supplant, to circumvent, to assail, to overreach. Ah, Jacob is a runner. Jacob is a controller. Jacob is a liar. Jacob speaks before understanding. Jacob is a thief. Je Jacob wrestles against God. Jacob is who we are. Oh, but grace, I need you to type in, but grace, but grace. But grace, verse 28 says, then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you struggle with God and with humans and have overcome. The transformation will happen in spite of who he thinks he is. Huh? What? Well, listen. Step into my Hebrew class with Dr. Tarsi Lee for a moment. In Hebrew, in Hebrew, uh, uh, the, the, the nifal stem is used to express simple action with either a passive or reflective voice. So often, whatever a cow stem verb means, the verb becomes passive or reflexive in the nifal stem. Oh, some of you do not know what on earth I'm talking about. Jacob can look back on his past. And when asked who he is, he uses historical references of his past to let him know that he has always been a liar, a deceiver, a controller, a manipulator. Jacob might have been a liar, but in the Nephal stem, he listen, listen, listen. When his name changes, Israel blesses who he encounters. Jacob might have spoken before for listening, but after his name changed, Israel listened. Jacob was a thief, but after his name changed, Israel is a giver. Jacob fought against God after his name changed. Israel fought for God. Jacob might be a runner, but after his name is changed, Israel is literally left with a limp. Jacob is who we were, but Israel, Israel is who we are intended to become. Israel is the overcomer. Israel is the winner. Look at verse 29. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? And then he blessed him there. Ah, so Jacob called the place Peniel saying, it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him and he passed Peniel and he was limping because of his hip. Ah, understand an encounter with God will limit a person's mobility. Oh, listen, listen, some of us, all of us, I dare say, need a limp. A limp will limit your ability to walk into places you have no business being in. A limp will limit your ability to walk away from your calling. A limp will limit your ability to walk the way that you walked before because when God causes a struggle, your limp will leave you a new person. I need there to be about five people in this chat who have had a dislocation occur, who know what it's like to walk with a limp, who have struggled and been made new, who understand that when God shows up, you talk a little different and you see a little different and you hear a little different and you walk a little different, who know that they've been touched and go to the naked eye Eye, the non-spiritual eye, it may seem like you're lost. Your infirmity, your injury, your inability, your invalidity, your trauma-induced impairment actually means that you won. Ah, the hip, the hip sits with the ball and joint. Your walk with God sits with your ability to be in alignment with God. And though, though, though the response may sometimes lead to impairments, be it physical, emotional, or even mental, you must recognize that sometimes we need to lose something in order to gain everything. Jacob lost his ability to run away. Jacob lost his ability to control the situation. And we tend to be this way. We tend to be deserters and controllers when things aren't going well in a relationship, in a marriage, in a 
a job, in our families. We pray for God to change the situation, but we control it ourselves. The irony of this passage is that God dislocates the very instrument that Jacob had been using to escape from his problems. Jacob is a runner, but instead of changing the situation, God changes him. Ah, you who are tuned in today may look at me and be tempted to say, Pastor, I, I don't, I don't want, I don't need a limp. I don't need him to take my car. Uh, uh, I don't need him to take my house. I don't need him to take my church. I don't need him to take any of my limbs, not my eyes, not my legs, not my tongues. I don't know, no, no. But hear me today, the very things you use and depend on for your strength, the very things that are keeping you from a real relationship with God, the more that you depend on you, the less you will depend on him. And right now, God, I want you to step in and I, I, in the mighty name of Jesus, give you permission. I ask you, God, that in whatever way you need to make us understand that we need to stop depending on our own strength, make us understand, God, that it is not about us. And that when you step in, what we think we've lost is actually a passageway to gaining. Because when Christ changed his name from Jacob to Israel, he was a runner no more. He was no longer worried about his future because God went before him. Because Matthew 5, 29 reminds me that it is better for me to lose one of my members than my whole body be thrown into hell. So Jacob has a limp. And you would, you, you, you would think that there is a happy ending. But after this limp, after this change, Israel still loses his son, Joseph. He still loses his wife, Rachel. But just because we have a face-to-face -face encounter with God, that does not mean that we're going to be free from the challenges of life. But God, is perfecting that limp. He is perfecting Jacob's character, now Israel's character. He is perfecting Israel because God loves him way too much to leave him the way that he found him. This physical change still needed to be worked out spiritually. And God determines, as Pastor Moore Johnston preached, God, that God would work out the life of his son Joseph for the good of their family to preserve their family in the long run. So how did Jacob's story end? Ah, Israel remains a limper, but this is no ordinary limp. This is a restorative limp, constantly relying on a rotation that is no longer longer normally there as it used to be. Ah, he cannot control his environment. He cannot control his movements. He cannot control because he is walking now more involuntarily than before. But literally, he is walking by the grace of the person who dislocated it in the first place. Ah, but limping towards the finish line, Israel still limped his way into the blessing of reconciliation with his father and Esau. Genesis 35 says, after all of this happens, Isaac lives to be 180 years old. And then verse 29 says, he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. Watch this but his sons, plural, Esau and Jacob buried him. He also got back Israel. Oh, listen, listen, this excites me because later in the story, the same son that Israel thought dead, Joseph is now given back to his family. Oh, don't miss this. Hear me today. The things that you so desperately hold on to will be the things lost in order to make a way for your future. What we've lost, what we've lost, we've actually gained. Ah, the things that you're worried about, the things that keep you up at night will no longer cause you anxiety when you start to walk with that limp. The things that you're scared of will no longer cause you fear because when God changes your walk, he is giving you a promise of a future. He is debilitating you so that you will be released from debilitating things. He's holding on to you so that you can release the things you held on to. He will become your crutch so that you will release the crutches you have created for yourself. You're being braced for a breakthrough. You are being broken down to be built back up and he will move you towards righteousness because he calls you righteous. He will move you from a shameful place to a graceful place. He will move you towards mercy because he gives you the mercy you so helplessly need. He 
because you finally feel freedom. I'm trying to free you today. Stop trying to hold on to your strength. Stop thinking that you've got this all figured out. Step aside and let God do what he needs to do. Let him take what you depend on. Lose the wrestling match. Win an abundant life. Clinging to Christ will be the only way to get through this life. Israel walked with a limp for the rest of his life. It was a daily reminder of his need to surrender to God. Luke 11, 3 says, give us this day our daily bread. God knows we couldn't possibly handle more. Now I'll be the first, I'll be the first, I'll be the first, JD, I'll be the first. I'll admit that I have some running tendencies. I have some controlling tendencies. Trust me, I truly believe that when you listen to a pastor's sermon, you are hearing what they are struggling with, what God is trying to convince them of. When you hear a good word from your friend, believe that God gave it to them first for a reason. And I know, I know that I have control issues. I want to control everything about me, from my public image to the way that my hair curls, everything to my job, to my relationships. Trust and believe. I strive to be in control, but God is trying to break the chokehold I have over my life. I don't give God the opportunity to flex his muscles for me, so it may be time that he flexes them on me. And he already has. Here's my personal testimony. I was on the brink of financial meltdown in the fall of 2018. My crutch at that time was my money. It's what I depended on. But God didn't make my paycheck bigger. When everything was falling apart, when the bills were coming due, when I had nowhere to go, no how, no how to eat, I didn't know how I was going to make my next month or meet my next month's bills. God did something. He made me understand, Michelle, do not compromise your integrity. Do not compromise your giving of your tithes and your offerings. Do not compromise. And listen, this is not about the conference. This is not about the churches. This is about your relationship with God. When when God tells you to do something, you do it in faith because that same verse in Malachi says, I will open up the windows of heaven and cause you to have blessings that will overflow. And listen to me, y'all. I am out of all of my debt. I have no credit card debt, no car loan debt, no debt. Why? Because I did what God asked me to do. I was faithful to him. And over a period of time, God cleared my debt. Listen to me today. You are holding on to things that you've got no business holding on to. You're trying to make things right that you know you need to let go of. Oh, I didn't have a stimulus check to release me back then. I didn't have a tax refund to release me back then. But right now I sit in front of you, credit card debt free and with a savings account because God is bigger than the things that I think have to be my crutch. What about you? What is your hip? What limb needs to be dislocated? What shameful and brazen and crap tactically bad crutches are holding you back? Are you ready to let God change the way that you deal with conflict? Are you ready for God to right the situation that you may have yourself wronged in the first place? Are you done tying up your laces and getting ready to run every time life doesn't go as planned? Are you going to allow him to change your name? It only takes one touch. And like Israel, your life will never be the same. I know I'm talking to someone tonight because God has laid you on my heart. I've been praying for you. God wants to release somebody tonight from those paralyzing and debilitating sins. If that is you, my sister or my brother, lean on the everlasting arms. I want you to bow your heads. I want to invite everyone who is under the spirit of God to release that thing, that thing that is strangling you, that thing that keeps you in your sin, that thing that keeps you up at night. What is it? Is it disappointment, disillusionment, distress, disgust, discouragement, a disagreement? You may have even been disfellowshipped. What is that thing that makes you feel like you've fallen into the abyss? Let it go. 
right now in the name of Jesus, let it go. At this moment, let it go. Release that thing. Release it in the name of Jesus. Release it. I want to pray with you. Wherever you are, you know who you are. I want to pray with you right now. Let's pray together. Father God, we need a limp. We need a limp. Father, whatever it is that needs to be removed, that is in the way of you doing what you need to do, God, release it, remove it in the mighty name of Jesus, God, and bring us to a place, God, where we can acknowledge that it is not our strength, it is not our doing, it is not by any means anything that we have done, God, that merits us this access to you, but because your son died and bled on Calvary, that we have this access to come to your throne and say, God, wrestle with me because I'm ready, God, to let you win. Just God, please, whatever it is, whatever needs to be changed, change it in the mighty name of Jesus, God. We know that the enemy tried to stop this message from reaching your children for a reason, but God, you are stronger than that defeated man. God, I know that there is someone under the sound of my voice that's saying, Pastor, I don't know how to release it, but let me tell you right now, all you have to say is, Lord, Lord, to you all I surrender, all to you I freely give. God, to you I surrender, I don't know how. God, I know that I will have a limp, I know that I will still have problems, but God, I surrender them right now to you. God, be the all in all that we need. Bless us, God, as we continue to move forward. Bless every hearer, every hearer of your word. And may we not just be hearers, but doers, God. Help us, Father, to be doers. Bless us and keep us. And forgive us for not coming to this realization before. Keep us close to you. In your holy and matchless name, we do pray these things. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to celebrate God for this mighty word that he brought tonight through his maidservant, Pastor Michelle. We're grateful because in this moment, God has given us the encouraging word that sometimes the devil will have us right where God wants us. <laughs> How God will use a limp in the physical to release us in the spiritual. And tonight I'm grateful because God brought this woman of God here tonight to remind us that we have opportunity to be released from whatever has us bound. I want to see if we can get this song played because this is the perfect moment to where we can hear this song, this message in the music as the appeal time of this moment. And we're going to see if we can get the volume up. There we go. Yeah, because someone's been changed.
waited for this moment to come and i won't let it pass me by yeah say hi Oh! 